What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Justin Editor Podcast, where we like to bring on the people behind the movies and TV shows that you love, talk to them about how those were made, and what got them into the industry. My name is Corey Cudney, and I am just an editor. But today I have with me somebody who has worked on tons of documentaries and TV shows. We're talking like Top Gear, Making of Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, Ferrari, Race to Immortality, Ronnie's, and the subject of today, mostly the brand new in theaters today, actually, if you are listening to this when the episode comes out, is Edgar Wright's new film, The Sparks Brothers, which chronicles Ron and Russell's journey from England to LA to back again. I actually have those reversed, but it's a fantastic (laughs) journey. Uh, We have the editor of The Sparks Brothers, Paul Trewartha, joining us today. Hello, hello. How are you doing? I am doing fantastic. Like we were just talking about before we went live, I enjoyed the film so, so much. So I can't thank you enough for coming on um, to talk about it today. I'm super excited to chat on it. No, it's a real pleasure. It's lovely to talk about the film. It's been a great project to work on. So yeah, always happy to talk about it. So I just want to jump right in with this on the first thing that I thought of as we were getting to, I, I don't know, probably like the hour 45, two hour mark was how hectic was this edit? Because we are we're traversing, you know, 50 years of content, a dozen interview subjects, media of all types going from like four, three old footage um, and literally pictures in like a film reel all the way up to today's standard of, you know, 16 by nine high def behind the scenes Mm. footage. So what was it like, you know, encompassing 50 years of these people's lives in a documentary? Yeah, I think, you know, with a project of this sort of scale, you have to stick to your guns and be confident in your approach. And I think that there's definitely a temptation to run before you can walk when you're Mm -hmm. dealing with so many assets. Um, You know, quite often there's a pressure for people, you know, people are eager to see things. And so you feel inspired to jump in um, before you've actually been able to properly break down the rushes. But you know, the longer I've done this, the more I've realized that, that, you know, it's just not the right way to approach it at all. And so, uh, you know, I always organize my projects in a sort of really diligent way. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's, you know, you're going weeks and weeks and weeks where you're just breaking down rushes, ingesting, (laughs) organizing. And, you know, there's a point, there's a sort of a tipping point, a critical tipping point where you know, now it's time. All of your ducks are in a line, you're in a really strong place. And the benefits after that are absolutely huge because you can just, you know, everything is exactly where you need it to be. Um, Mm -hmm. You're super organized and and then you can really have some fun. And also it just really helps in terms of flow. You know, if you're organized and you can access what you need when you need it, you know, the edit just goes so smoothly from that point. So, uh, yeah, sticking to your guns for that period of time. And I mean, we had a vast quantity of assets in this one. You're absolutely (laughs) right. I mean, there really was a vast quantity. Yeah. How did y'all get all of those assets together? Like, that's a fantastic point of just, like you said, how vast amount of those um, were all of those supplied um, by the Sparks Brothers themselves? Like, how did you guys gather all of those assets? So um, Kate Griffiths was the um, our, um, archive supervisor on this. And, you know, she did an amazing job um, with um, Tess McNally Watson. Um, together, they were on the project for a fair while before I came on. And um, they actually used a system called FileMaker, which was just a great way of um, annotating all uh, details regarding all of the archive so that that was accessible to everybody you know, who wanted to have a look at it. Um, it was all available. And, and at the same point of, of in, at ingesting those assets, they were actually able to give them a unique ID. And so every yeah. single individual piece of archive had actually been, um, you know, given an ID, broken out and described. And so we're all sort of aware of it and organized to a degree. And then it's a case of just working out, you know, uh, quite a lot of that information doesn't naturally translate into Mm -hmm. the um, NLE. Um, And so you actually have to find a way of utilizing the good work that's been done to drive you forward nice and quickly. And, you know, I work very closely with my assistants to do that, basically. Yeah. Wow. And you guys used uh, Premiere for this film? 
Yeah, it seems that basically every job I do um, flips me between Premier and Avid. I just keep flipping <laughs> backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. Um, and there are huge benefits. Uh, to, to both pieces of software, I'm I'm sort of very happy to work in either. Um, I actually think that Premiere was a great choice for this particular film. Um, there are various reasons for that, um, but I think for me the main one actually came down to um, you saw that there were a lot of contact sheets, and they, they mm. we were really fortunate because in the early stages of their career, they were actually a good friend of theirs and um, a part of their team uh, was also f- um, taking photographs of them all the time and obviously was in a position to develop their own pictures at that time. And mm. so um, they were taking runs of stills of them in, you know, sort of rehearsal rooms and, you know, around and about, and we got some really magical moments. Um, I was just able to, you know, sort of take all of those contact sheets, scale them down to a, a, a degree whereby they were sort of screen resolution, but still much, much bigger than the native resolution that we were working at. And so I was able to actually move through those, see them in detail. And that is why, you know, in the early section, we were so easily able to utilize so many of those and animate them just live on the timeline. So all of the animations oh, of those wow. contact sheets you see in the early section, um, mm-hmm. Were done straight on the timeline. They've been translated straight through. Um, so oh, wow. it just it sort of set the aesthetic really that we were able to do that. Now with with today's times, especially with all these projects, I feel like I always have to ask: Were you guys uh, wrapped before COVID kind of hit, or <laughs> were you finishing the project as the pandemic kind of unfolded, or, or what was the timeline like for you guys? It was basically half and half. Okay. So there, yeah. So so there was. Um, we were um, cutting in town um, um, in Soho, um, and uh, we were there. We had a, a great space, and it was wonderful. I, I you know, I was um, Edgar was in the building all the time. You know, we had uh, George Henkin, one of the producers. She was with me all the time. Um, the Tess was actually one of, as I say, one of the archivists. She was in the suite the whole time. Along with, um, there was actually a, a Nick, a, a second assistant on this, uh, sorry, a second editor on this um, uh, for a period of the, of the edit. Um, and so, to be honest, it was a, it was a great, really creative space um, where we were, you know, all working, you know, we all, we're all in our boat together, all, all pushing forward together. And, and it was a really lovely period of the edit and really super <laughs> productive. Um, and then, obviously, COVID hit. Um, and uh, I, but it was very easy at that point because I was able to transfer all of the rushes to, you know, sort of drives and, and pull back to my own suite. And, you know, I've been freelance for well over a decade now and I've been working from my own suite from day one pretty much. So the transition to working back from mine was seamless, you know. Um, nice. Yeah. Yeah, it was cool. So for anybody who hasn't seen the film yet, a lot of the film is – uh, talent sitting down and kind of driving the story forward um, through their testimonials, for lack of a better word. One of the first things that I thought of when I was, you know, watching the movie was I know editors are on set a lot of the times for a lot of these films. Were you able to be on set for any of these uh, interviews? For because like they they range from like Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers to just like, I mean, Edgar Wright himself, the Sparks Brothers. Um, so were you able to attend these these uh, interviews? I wish I was. I wasn't, unfortunately. <laughs> the The interviews took place in, they actually filmed in five cities. Uh, the interviews themselves took place in LA, New York, and London. Oh, wow. So they were split into three batches. Um, and, you know, it was a fantastic setup they had. And obviously, they, you know, Edgar had a very clear look that he wanted um, mm. for the interviews. Um, and, and they're very strong and it's quite nice actually, because that, you know, it works so well because the film obviously has a collage element to it. We incorporate animation and, you know, in all forms of archive, as you say, we've kept the, the archive in its native ratio and, you know, for, 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 for many reasons. And, um, and so the fact that, you know, the, the archive itself and the aesthetic can be quite eclectic, it's, I think it's really lovely that when you return back to the interviews, you're returning back to a, a very formal look. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it, it creates a beautiful spine. I wasn't able to uh, be on um, at any of the interviews because I was actually finishing up on, on Ronnie's, as you mentioned. 
So there was actually a small section of, of, of edit that started and took place before I actually came on board. Um, and, and then as soon as I was actually able to flip across, I, I did so. And, uh, and that was fantastic. That worked out beautifully. So, um, yeah, uh, it, it, I would have loved to have been there. There were some really awesome contributors who I would have loved to have met. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I, I, I'm just in my suite the whole time. All the time. <laughs> <laughs> how much, like, I know that, that it's impossible to nail down an actual number, but like, how much footage did they give you of just sheer interviews? Because I imagine there is a ton left over. Yeah. I mean, there were 80 interviews in total. Um, there were, and uh, the, I mean, for example, with Ron and Russell, there were 11 individual interview set, you know, periods, uh, there was a set up. So there was over 18 hours of interview with Ron and Russell themselves. <laughs> um, oh my God. And then you had the other 80, you know, on top of that. And there is a lot of great stuff for, you know, with every single interview, Edgar used a thing called Nearwig. And so towards the back end of the interview, um, there was actually a period where the contributors were actually able to, you know, when, when they sort of said, Edward would say to them, you know, what's your favorite song? What's, you know, what, what's the song that means something to you? Um, they, you know, they would say what, you know, their favorite was, and he was actually able to play it to them from his phone. Um, and they were able to talk over the track as it was playing in their ear. And obviously all of those channels got fed to me. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. So there, there's some, there's some amazing, there's some amazing content. Um, I think the thing with all of these things is, you know, from an editor's perspective, um, there's it is interesting to consider at the end of a, a job. It is interesting to consider what actually didn't make it into the final edit. Yeah. Um, and certainly, I'm sure you're more so aware that sometimes, you know, there's real gold that you'd absolutely love to get into the edit, but um, it just doesn't advance the narrative. I mean, the way that we structure this. Uh, there was from the very, very get go, it was really clear that Edgar's intention was to um, approach this film chronologically. And also he felt it was absolutely critical to to treat um, and give emphasis to every single album, because I think it's just hugely important that everybody appreciates that, you know, Ron and Russell mm -hmm. are a live band. They're going, you know, they're moving forward, they're advancing, they're progressing their sound as much today as they ever have done. And I think that, you know, they had been approached many times in the past where people wanted to make a feature documentary about them. And I think, it, you know, I think what they appreciated more often than not, people actually just wanted to focus on, you know, the 70s and that sort of period. And, you know, as we say in the film, they're just not interested in looking back particularly. I mean, we laughed mm -hmm. many times whilst we were doing the edit that we're, you know, sort of tracking through their career and they say so often they're not interested in looking back. So well, I hope <laughs> they're going to like the film. <laughs> Which fortunately they do. But, um, you know, so... I, there, as I say, there was just an absolutely vast array of assets and um, the way that we approached the uh, the film itself and uh, was to actually track through album by album. And so, you know, we actually cut and did justice to every single album. There was a point where we had anywhere between 15 minutes up to 45 minutes um, of a, a full edit with sound, graphics, everything in place, really very watchable for every single album. <laughs> and uh, and so, you know, there, then there was a point where we can, you know, sort of, and then we distilled those down and distilled them into still them. And, uh, and then we sort of strung, did a string out of all of those. And then we were in a really luxurious position, actually, of being able to look through and think, because, you know, that that's, sort of service us to tell their story chronologically but I also and this is sort of critical really I actually had you know sort of thematic pods within my timeline so the interview content obviously wasn't just broken down into um the album that wouldn't make any sense yeah. so the interview was very much more thematically broken down dealing with them as brothers and you know, sort of a lot of other themes that cut through. And then it was a case of, right, okay, we now can we can now see how their sound develops over time. Mm -hmm. And we can see really obvious places whereby it would make perfect sense to discuss certain facets of their interaction and things like that. And we were actually able to deploy those at an appropriate time throughout their narrative. So that's where the sort of thematic breakdown came in line, you know, fell in line with the, uh, the, the chronological aspect and, and the development of their sound. Wow. That's a brilliant idea to have a reserve and be like, all right, this is 
this is this, you know, sequence or whatever. And it's just full of these thematic elements. Oh, we can fit that in this place. That That is a genius idea. I think the other thing is, you know, I, it was really sort of critical for us that there was a sort of natural flow to that as well, whereby, um, you know, I think the beauty of approaching um, a long career chronologically and, you know, is the fact that we try to provide a platform, a natural platform where uh, a viewer can can move through their career in a natural way and actually see correlation between, you know, sort of echoes of themes that resonate through time and time again throughout their career. Mm-hmm. And as such, you know, sort of draw their own conclusions and find their own connections about how the brothers work together and what was their main motivation for their sound. Because although the albums can sound very different, um, themes like their sort of um, anti-establishment sort of punky sensibility, that sort of resonates at different times in different ways. And I think that you sort of feel that quite naturally because you've sort of experienced it in the microcosm by stepping through their their whole career chronologically. So that was a yeah. that was a really sort of positive take out from from this approach. How familiar with F- Sparks were you coming into this project? Were you already a fan? Had you just heard of them or and I was in a really fortunate position, I think, because I was somebody who had a, 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 a loose knowledge of them. Mm-hmm. You know, I, it, I certainly was aware of them. There have been many, many, many people uh, since the, the, you know, the, the first trailer went out who were saying, is this a real band? You know, is it, are they real? <laughs> um, and I certainly wasn't in that position. I was very, very aware of, of this town, you know, being the big mm-hmm. hit in the UK. Um, and I was also aware of other tracks that they had made, but I, I certainly wouldn't have counted myself um, as a huge fan, which I now do. And I mean, I mm-hmm. think this is the thing. I, I, I think that, this, again, as from an editor's perspective, you go on your own personal journey with every film you work on. Mm-hmm. Um, and, 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 and it's really quite important that some of the uh, lessons that you know you learn along the way. You try and actually inject some of those I- I- into the edit itself because you become aware of things and appreciate things. There were songs um, at the beginning um, I just I, I just couldn't get my head around. Um, and actually, <laughs> through the repetitious action of you know sort of hearing them and working with them and hearing other people talk about them, they became accessible to me. And as a consequence of that. Um, they've ended up becoming some of my favorite songs, you know. And so I think it's, the, it's like the equivalent of actually doing justice to an album by listening to it track by track. I think, mm-hmm. if you, you know, with any band and any album, if you actually go to the effort of listening to the album in the way that it's supposed to be listened to, you actually feel like you've learned something about the band at the end of the day. And, you know, one mm-hmm. of the main problems now when it comes to, to playlists, I mean, playlists are fantastic. I mean, I've been making mixtapes since, you know, <laughs> since I was really young. So, I, I, you know, I love a mixtape. I love a playlist. Yeah. But I do think that there's, you know, it's, it's really important, actually. You know, if a band actually puts together an album, chooses songs to go in a specific order, that you actually listen to those. And, and that will help you get to understand what they were trying to achieve with that album. Um, and I think that, you know, making this film has worked for me in that way in a, in a huge scale. And I felt like I, I learned so much about the band. But also I was able to provide the team uh, with the perspective of somebody who isn't fully immersed in the band. So quite often, they're, you know, uh, George and um, Edgar and Kate and Tess were all, you know, really massive fans and very, very, very knowledgeable <laughs> about the band. And so I was actually able to moderate some enthusiasm sometime and say, actually, you know, there are certain elements that are slightly more accessible and how do we make this more relatable and, you know, all of those sorts of things, which, you know, wasn't a difficult job. Um, it was really yeah. easy in many respects, but I, I think I was able to bring something to the party in that regard as well. Yeah, you guys do a phenomenal job introducing the band and the concepts. And like you said, going through each album, because as somebody who had legitimately never heard of Sparks going into this film myself, um, exactly like you said, I by the end of it, I have become a fan. Mm-hmm. And it's a testament to how you guys did because, you know, I go out on a walk around my apartment complex and I can go through the discography and each one I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the song they talk about. I can start with this and actually listen to the song all the way through. And it's like, oh, yeah, this is awesome. I, I, I know these these 
these tracks now. And so I think that's just yeah. a testament to how good you guys did throughout the uh, film. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you. And you mentioned earlier Edgar Wright's real passion, yeah, for the for the actual project itself. And watching it, I'm a big Edgar Wright fan myself, and uh, I, I've got to know if I'm just projecting onto the film. Um, but I feel like a lot of the cuts have that like patented Edgar Wright energy to him. I mean, the the cut on beats are are so good, like the title cards specifically. Um, you always nail the the dictionary definitions, like with the drum beats and everything. Um, so, like I said, am I projecting? Was that an intentional cause um, to really nail that motion that he's kind of known for in the documentary? Well, I, th- I think you know Edgar's really fastidious and and uh, as a director, and I mean he's um, yeah, I mean his style is 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 is, is well known and, and obvious. Um, I think the you know for me the the great thing about working with Edgar is the fact that we actually do sort of share you know very much a common aesthetic in that regard and a mm. common desire to make something you know I you know those you know the timing of those uh, those titles and stuff originated from myself um, <laughs> and it you know sort of and and so that's and that's how I would want them to appear and stuff like that yeah. however you know it, it, it would be you know edgar's got a really obviously a really clear opinion about what he likes and doesn't like and um, i i think a good working relationship is one where you're both uh, pulling in the same direction um mm. i think if there were times that you know i tried something and edgar wasn't sure he would definitely say something and that that's, that's no issue at all however i have to say that 99% of the time we're just pulling in the same direction we both sort of nice. you know um you know it's just a, a it's always been a really sort of um a good working relationship where but i by i think that um yeah we're sort of you know like like the same things and enjoy the the, the presentation and the way you know things cut and i mean documentary is obviously a, a different thing I, uh, in mm. terms of you know he's he's the beauty of edgar's work is that he's actually able to control the camera work, the cuts, everything, you know, and it's all, it all, you know, stems back to the storyboards, you know, incredible storyboards. And obviously you can't do that with documentary. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I know, you know, even from, you know, the very first teasers um, that, you know, came out um, that we've sort of worked on and had been worked on, you know, the pacing of it, um, it, it you know, it always felt like an Edgar film. I think is he, what he does so well is he provides a sort of platform to allow everybody to do what they do. Um, but I think everybody, you know, sort of is aware, you know, of his aesthetic. And I think that that has an impact, you know, in the way that you work and the way that you approach something. So for example, so often, I might um, naturally think, oh, there's a bit of space there. We'll sort of leave that. And it's just like, oh, there's an amazing point. Do you remember the point somebody said? And then his enthusiasm to sort of bolster <laughs> sections with additional comments, you know, increased the pace of every single section. So in some respects, that was a really nice exercise. You know, it's kind of like, oh, we can't get somebody else in there, can we? Yeah, yeah, we can. Let's do this. And let's, you know, and then <laughs> and we would. And And I think the really nice part of that is the fact that, you know, the film obviously running over, you know, sort of, you know, uh, about two hours, 20 minutes, um, you know, I think we we never felt like it was long for the sake of it. In fact, to be honest with you, it's long. It's it's, it's the length that it is simply because it, there's so much to get in and there's so much yeah. enthusiasm from Edgar to get more and more and more and more in. And I think that that's <laughs> evident in the pacing of it because you can see it's, it's, it's frenetic in the way that, you know, there's no let up. It's just, mm-hmm. you know, there's just so much to get through. And once you've sort of um, made the decision to do justice to every album, you're, you're doing justice to every single album. <laughs> and um, there was certainly a point whereby, we, we, you know, we, we tried to actually sort of cut it down from there. And I think we sort of felt that, you know, when it comes to Sparks fans, there's not really any such thing as a, a fan that's not a diehard fan. You know, they're, they're <laughs> hardcore fans. I mean, they love them. And it would, it would have been such a shame to have, you know, sort of skirted over one period or, two, you know, two, three albums um, mm-hmm. just to sort of hit a specific duration. I think we sort of felt that um, we wanted this to be you know, the definitive account of their career and, 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 you know, knowing that they, you know, felt quite legitimately that every single album had its worth. 
and the fact that we were actually able to allow the structure of the film to mirror something that they had done in their own lives with 21 Nights um, and actually approach each album and do justice to each album, as Jonathan Ross says, um, you know, it's important to them because there is uh, beauty and progression in every single album. And um, so, yeah, we just wanted to do justice for them because they do deserve it. So this is taking a complete side fork in the road. Mm. But you just mentioned it. I had completely forgotten about it that as soon as they mention that in the documentary, we're going to play all 21 albums back to back. I was like, how insane is that? Because nobody, that's like, just people don't do that. That's in, like watching them and they're like, yeah, by week three, we've forgotten week one's stuff. And I'm like, that is just bananas to even attempt. It is. And it, and, and it's so perfect for them as well. I think it, it was such a, a, a lovely moment, a, such a lovely beat in the film to be able to put that in, because I think that does make it, you know, it makes the audience aware of, of it's not just the, it's the, the scale of the body of work that they have produced <laughs> is just insane, you know, and, mm -hmm. and how different it all is. And, uh, you know, acoustically and to, I mean, you know, that's another factor to include in that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, album for album, you know, it, there's, there are different lineups and there's different, you know, it's, it's a different acoustically completely different. So yeah. um, it is an amazing achievement. I actually have watched the film um, with a musician friend of mine, Mm -hmm. And uh, when that concept was presented, um, it actually sort of uh, made the person actually gasp as a consequence. <laughs> it was like, no, this is this is this is probably insane. And uh, you know, and uh, you know, credit to them to be honest with you. And I think it does sum them up beautifully. Um, and uh, yeah, one of my favourite moments. That. <laughs> so you mentioned a little bit earlier pacing, and the word that you used is. Funny enough, the exact same word that I used, which is frenetic, mm. and um, I, I absolutely love it. And so there's one specific example that I was watching through the film that I was like, I wonder if that was planned or in the edit spontaneously, which is they're talking about um, an early manager and they're like, oh, without so and so, there is no sparks. And then you cut to the manager and he's like, well, I don't know if there'd be no sparks, but there'd definitely be no, you know, Hudson or whatever it was. Yeah. Um, and that's such a good, like, it, it's like they're having a conversation in the same room. And so yeah. it's such a good edit. So is that something that was planned on or did they just, did you just find that while you were watching, you know, selects and you were like, Oh, this works perfect. Yeah. A hundred percent. It's, it's the latter. I mean, it's kind of the, 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 I mean, there was so much content, um, from, from, in terms of the interviews, uh, what I was actually, what I did was I, um, I actually transcoded all of the interviews to MP3. Mm. And so I was able to, um, you know, on the train, on the way in and out of the edit, <laughs> I was actually able to sort of listen to the, you know, sort of all of the contributors to actually sort of get an overview of everything that we had while mm -hmm. simultaneously breaking those interviews down during the day. And you do sort of form these natural connections. And I do, th and you know, I love it where you can uh, provide a, an immediate counterpoint to a concept because yeah. um, I think it's really important that, you know, the, the whole process of editing is the fact that you can manipulate dialogue to, to, to work in any way you, you see fit. But that's not really what you should be doing. You know, <laughs> I think it's yeah. about creating a, a, a balanced, perspective um and actually sort of i think a counterpoint and providing an immediate counterpoint i think hopefully demonstrates that we're actually trying to create like a balanced perspective i mean for example i can promise you that we are not although we're sitting on a wealth of rushes i can promise you in the suite we're not sitting on a wealth of people talking disparagingly about the band <laughs> i mean people didn't have a bad word to say about them and when you meet them you can understand why you know, um, when when the band did break up, you know, we, we actually sort of we did put it in there. You know, it's kind of like when, you know, the manager was extremely disappointed and, and it made perfect sense that he was disappointed because they were onto a winning formula mm. um, and they'd had enough of the UK and they decided it was time to go back to the US. And, you know, in the short term, it certainly worked to the detriment of the band um, for all of them, because, you know, they could have, you know, stayed in the UK, they could have kept producing albums, they could have kept the sound, um, but they wouldn't be sparks. 
you know and yeah. i think that's exactly the point that is being made and i think i think also you know making this film with the benefit of many years that have passed by i think everyone can become a touch more reflective about you know i think had you spoken to the band that year they yeah. <laughs> probably <laughs> would have had something else to say um, yeah. But I think it's a testament to their, you know, the development of the relationship of the guys with the people in the band. Um, uh, you know, years have gone by. They've seen how sparks have grown and developed. And I think they feel really pacified that, you know, they were just happy to be on the journey for a period of that journey. And I think that's the sentiment that sort of resonated for all of the previous band members that we nice. spoke to. I love that you you use a like a match cut in a very specific way. So like the last example was kind of like an auditory match cut, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. Another one that really stuck out to me um, was, well, the two others that really stuck out to me was the the rocket ship taking off, where that one's yeah. more of just like an L cut, but, but still works really well to carry the motion into another scene. Um, and then the other one is the roller coaster cut, where you mm. start <laughs> a camera shake in an interview section and it carries over uh, into the natural camera shake that was in the roller coaster film. Um, and this yeah. is kind of the same question, but is a lot of that just you having fun, you know, just sitting down at the computer and being like, oh, this would be really funny if I did this? Uh, 100%. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we had uh, the, the beautiful thing is that, um, you know, having uh, tests in the suite with me whilst we were cutting, um, we it, it was it was lovely because I was um, able to you know just turn around to test and say right okay how about if we you know for this section why don't we you know <laughs> consider themes like this we could talk about themes and just have some fun with it so uh, you know for the song tits and stuff like that and we were like what's an amusing way to represent this and so we you know got a couple of blue tits and the blamanges and the melons <laughs> and things like this and so we were sort of just having some fun you know and and i think you know the thing about um the band themselves is they are you know they're, they're humorous they've they've got their tongue firmly planted in their cheek quite a lot of the time and i think it's that it's that sentiment that actually gave us the latitude to approach you know, their life story in the way that we did. I mean, not many bands would be prepared to allow, you know, their life story to be, and their albums and their previous work to be uh, represented as a flop. I think one of my <laughs> um, favorite examples of, of having fun with Archive is actually the belly flop. I think that the belly flop on, on this, you know, sort of the release of their first album, <laughs> I think is kind of, um, you know, it's funny at the time, but then I, I sort of took great pleasure then in actually, I don't know if you've noticed, but, it, you know, at the back end of their career, when we're sort of summing them up and summing up, you know, sort of, you know, the benefits of the, of the approach of actually sticking to their guns, we actually mm -hmm. take the same belly flop you get at the beginning in the first the release of the first album and we actually reverse it. Oh. And, you know, so it's it's literally taking back that failure and saying it's the failure that you we represented with the belly flop at the front end of the film, at the back end <laughs> of the film, we're sort of now we've given you the context you know, the fact that they didn't have huge financial success with that first album, you know, you could easily think, well, it's got it's a failure then. It's like, well, actually, it's not a failure because it's the building block that's allowed mm -hmm. them to progress through their career and, and, and keep making music for as long as they have. And then that is, goes to a match cut of, of Russell landing on stage in the Kentish Town performance, you know, to an adoring um, audience. And I just kind of, you know, I took great pleasure in that because that was literally visually, you know, taking that back, taking back that assumed failure and, and, and repositioning the idea of what is success specifically for pop. I think there would be no doubt that in many, many areas of music that success could be um, attributed to many different things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, artistic success. You know, if you spoke to a, a classical musician who had struggled financially their entire life, but, you know, had stayed true to themselves, you think, yeah, that's, I can understand that. But with pop music, I think that there's a, definitely an assumption that a successful band is a financially successful band, you yeah. know, and and I hope that in this film we provide a, a, an opportunity for people to take another look at not just Sparks, but, you know, other artists that didn't necessarily make it past 
you know, certainly there's not many who have made as many albums as they have, but um, <laughs> certainly hopefully it does reposition, you know, sort of make people reanalyze what success means in, in that arena, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, I, and they're great for that because they're such a great example of that. So my last like Sparks related question, um, it became a mini game while I was watching this film, um, which was the lower thirds, uh, figuring yeah. out like paying attention to see what people would get and see if their title changed um, mm. and everything like that. Um, a, a really good thing that you did, uh, speaking of failure, um, was another manager of theirs was like, I'll put my career on the line, you know, if this album doesn't do well. And then you change the lower third where, where the album doesn't do well. And he, you know, the new lower third runs in. So was the lower thirds is who came up with the lower thirds? Cause you have some absolutely great ones um, in there and everything. So who was in charge of coming up with the lower third jokes? (laughs) That was very much a team effort. I mean, in that regard, we were all just trying to make each other laugh. Mm-hmm. You know, Edgar was obviously responsible for many, many of them. You know, a whole bunch of them are mine. Um, George <laughs> as well. Um, we were all just trying to make each other laugh. I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. There was a point where they were a lot more extreme than the version that you see in the final edit. <laughs> there was a point where we, 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 I think we all appreciated that we pushed it too far. Because I think the other thing that we've really tried to do with this film is to not actually... It, we, the last thing we wanted was for it to feel exclusivist. Mm-hmm. At any stage that um, this is a band that you need, you know, you've got you've got to be cool to understand, you know, yeah. that is absolutely not in any way, shape or form that you know, and never was our motivation. And I think what we realized at some point was the fact that although with some of the lower thirds, we they, they were really funny, it had got to a point where some of them felt a bit like an in-joke. Um, and so we sort of had to moderate ourselves a touch and pull back and actually make sure we had given people the relevant information when required. But, um, things like Beck, the above, um, you know, yeah. they, just, they just made us laugh too much to be able, we couldn't just give those up. So, yeah, they were really so looking back on the project, um, you know, are, are you, are you pretty happy seeing people's, uh, reactions on Twitter? I know we were talking about this a little bit. Um, mm. before the show and everything. Um, but the reception has been purely positive in my, you know, what I've seen online. So how is it like seeing people respond like that? It's just been fantastic, you know, really fantastic. I think we felt really strongly, as I say, it was such a, a personal project for everybody involved. And, you know, it's also, it's also a strange time. You know, the, the cinemas are opening again, you know, for the first time in a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you can understand, you know, it's, 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 it's a unique situation we find ourselves in. Um, and this is a very unique film, um, you know, structurally, the band are very unique, you know, every, everything about it. And so, you know, we put everything into it, you know, uh, all of our love, all of our attention, all of our hard work and a lot of long hours um, into making it uh, as good as we possibly can do. And so you can only hope that it is received, you know, positively, you know, to, to not just do justice to the efforts you put in, but to make sure that you've done justice to the subject matter, you know, this being mm-hmm. non Um And, you know, uh, it, and so it's been amazing to see the reaction. We are all blown away. There's been a lot of, you know, internal communication about how happy we are with the response. And, um, you know, people are going out to see it. People are getting dressed up to go out and see it. People are taking pictures of themselves by the posters and, you know, sort of uh, shots of their screen, you know, their, their ticket stubs and, you know, and, and comments and, you know, and, and Ron and Russell clearly love it as well. Because if you look at the Sparks official um, <laughs> Instagram stories, you know, they're sharing these things. Edgar's sharing these things. There's a direct line of communication with the band and Edgar in that regard, um, through all of these platforms. And, and, and rightly so, because it is, you know, a, a, a small family has made this, you know, uh, and, and, and we're just hugely appreciative of, of the positive response, hugely. Well, you've all definitely deserved it. Uh, like I've said numerous times uh, today, the the film is awesome. I love it. Uh, the film 
as we've said numerous times, is the Sparks Brothers. If you're listening to this, when the episode is out, um, it is in theaters right now. If it's been a little while uh, while you're listening to the episode, it's probably on VOD somewhere, and you should watch it. But that is the here, and that is the now. Um, This is actually the longest we've gone on a current project, which I absolutely love. Um, But we're going to go all the way back, Paul, to the beginning of your career, because I want to know what got you into editing in the first place? What inspired you, you know, uh, movies you watched and everything like that? What what got you into it? I mean, I, I love storytelling. That's my thing. It's so funny as an editor, so often you people sort of say when you've worked on a, on a documentary or something, they say, oh, what's your favorite sequence? And it's like, I always take a much greater pleasure from the arc and the actual mm-hmm. the storytelling, of, you know, across the whole film because that is a lot more nuanced and and complex than a specific montage for example or something like that (laughs) so storytelling is 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 at the very heart of it i mean i i did go a a slightly quirky way in um whereby (laughs) you know i i I sort of had i've always had a love of film from Mm -hmm. from from day one you know my my family all have a love of film and um and so film was very much a way for us all to uh, get together relate and chat and all those sorts of things so um yeah film has was there and then i and i always loved drawing and so i had a a, a tutor a, a teacher sorry once who sort of decided that the the, the most logical way to uh, combine film and drawing was animation <laughs> and uh, they were very literal. <laughs> and so I found myself doing an animation degree and knowing that it wasn't quite right for me, but enjoying it, very much enjoying it. But knowing that, it, you know, I have said subsequent to having finished it is that once you've done, once you've studied or worked in animation specifically, sort of, well, any sort of animation, to be honest with you, um, everything else after that is easy because you know it's, <laughs> there's so much work. And so I was doing traditional 2D cell animation at university. Oh, man. And um, yeah, so that, that, that was, um, and, but, but there was an opportunity on that course to actually start editing. And so I, the first thing I actually cut was on a, 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 an old VHS tape to tape machine uh, working, you know, just having some fun. So we were produce things under a rostrum camera and then cut them together to music. And um, it was hilarious because the rooms that were allocated for that at the time were, I think they were literally cupboards and, <laughs> you know, they were tiny. And uh, and we would have so many people crammed into one of these tiny little cupboards, literally people sitting on each other's laps like four high. And I, and I always seemed to find myself push having pushed to the front and be the person with my finger on the buttons because I just got hugely frustrated very quickly if I if that wasn't the case and I think <laughs> that's sort of where I've stayed really I'm I'm still not entirely sure how directors sit in an edit suite mm-hmm. uh, without wanting to get their hands on the keyboard and the mouse it still sort of blows my mind that they <laughs> they're actually able to do it but um I uh yeah because I absolutely had to find a way to get my fingers on on the controls and yeah and I love it so out of school, um, what was kind of your first industry gig? Did you actually land a a job pretty quickly out of out of school, or did did it take a little while? I um, so I was pretty lucky. I, I sort of left university, and then um, it was a, there was a small hiatus where I you know put applications in. I um, yeah, th- there are quite a few um, post production facilities in in Soho in London, and uh, that's the sort of Certainly, historically, that was the centre for, and it still is in many respects. Although it's a much more dislocated industry now, um, mm-hmm. but um, and so uh, you know, I I, I put a I, I phoned up about a job. I saw a job, and they said, "Oh, I'm I'm really sorry, the job's actually gone." And I was like, "Oh, please, just meet with me, just meet with me." And uh, I, I really pushed and pushed and pushed, and I ended up, you know, getting a a, a, a meeting with the, the the managing director of that uh, company, and I spoke to her for. A long time. <laughs> I think I, 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 I talked to her a long time. I was very, very, very enthusiastic, and it and it worked. And I, I actually um, they created another position um, <laughs> because it was a runner's position, and I, you know, we weren't the most expensive people to employ. Um, and so, the, yeah, so I actually did that, get in there, and then again, I, I was pretty fortunate. I was I, I very happily, you know, sort of made teas and coffees and brought food for about six months, and then. Um, the lead editor there left and uh, they came to me and said, right, we've got a choice. You either 
decide that this is exactly what you want to do and you go for it and throw yourself in at the deep end or we can bring somebody in and I was like no let's let's go for it and so I you know I I swatted up I read every manual there were times where I was literally <laughs> <laughs> in an edit and then requested to do something and I'd say hang on a second I just need to pop outside a second and you know looking <laughs> at the manual and checking that out furiously and coming back in confidently and like yeah absolutely I know how to do it and so it really was a trial by fire but um, no I was sitting with clients um, cutting from you know sort of six months in there and and um, and then I was sort of in control of the avid side of the business whereas um, mm-hmm. the rest of the, the other side was into online so um, at that point I was you know very much I could not just edit but it was sort of running that side you know breaking the machines apart fixing them putting them back together again so having oh, an, yeah. half an eye on the technical aspect as well as the creative has always been something I've always sort of tried to keep abreast of because I just think it helps you just you know if you're across it technically you can just be confident with the kit that you're using um yeah. I, I can't imagine being in a position whereby you know certainly these days I'd never want to be in a position ever again whereby <laughs> I wasn't completely confident with the kit that I was actually using um, because I just think that's your, that's your, they're, they're your tools, aren't they? That's your, your paint and your canvas. And so you've just got to be able to, that's got to be intuitive. So you can just focus on what you're supposed to be doing, which is the creative aspect. Yeah, it always definitely comes in handy if something does go wrong that you know, like, okay, it could be one of these three things. Like, let's mm. figure out what it is. Um, so that's yeah. a fantastic point. Yeah, and I think that you know it's like, and and, and experience counts for a lot in that regard as well. I mean, you mm-hmm. know, there, there, there's so many times where I'm I'm you know sort of working with assistants and 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 you know they there's a problem, and they're like, oh you know I've I've tried this and that and this and that, and you end up with a sort of a, a mental checklist technically of things to try, and nine times out of ten it'll be one of the things that you've sort of, you know, experienced before, you know, it doesn't matter which piece of software you're using. Um, And, and and that's always satisfying as well. Cause you sort of think, oh, those, those, those years, they count, they do count for something. (laughs) (laughs) So I notice on your IMDB um, going through it, you kind of start with like TV series and shorts in your credits. And then once you hit documentaries, it's kind of like that's where you that's where you've kind of settled, it seems like, um, yeah. in into that cubby hole, for lack of a better term. Um, mm. So what was that kind of transition like? And I guess it's, you know, have you found like where you would like to stay kind of like in the documentaries or are you always open to try other things, I guess? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've, I would always say never say never to anything because mm-hmm. I think you don't know what you don't know. And yeah. so, always, you know, really happy to to try anything. However, I, you know, from the perspective of an editor, I can't see a greater challenge out there than documentary. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, with scripted feature, um, obviously the edit is, as, as is often referred to, it's the final part of the script. And so, you know, and, and there is a lot of them, you know, you can do amazing things and transform a film in the edit. So it's not in any way suggesting that that's not the case. But, you know, from a from the perspective of storytelling, you know, it, I, what I absolutely love is, you know, you've got hundreds of hours of rushes and you are finding the narrative. You are finding the story. You are. I love the research element of it. You know, I love the fact that, you know, uh, YouTube is an amazing thing. It doesn't help you really in terms of you can't use anything that's come off of there. But what you can do is use it for research and find yeah. these connections. I, I love the sort of slightly journalistic aspect to it, um, uh, you know, and and certainly, for example, with Ferrari, that was an amazing thing. Somebody presented us with a, I, I can't remember the musician now, but it was like a, a second DVD where they'd actually found that, that, that there was some footage on it. And I think originally the idea was that we were going to be in a position to be able to rip the DVD and use that as source. And I kept saying, but I, I, I know that those masters, those, those rushes must be out there somewhere. And we ended up tracking them back to um, a, a castle in Germany. Oh and, and they were in a terrible, terrible state. And then we got the film transferred. 
And there was, it was just absolutely, it was one of those magic moments. There was re, there was so much gold in there. And <laughs> it totally and utterly changed the film because suddenly we went from having no personal content to a wealth of personal content of these drivers. And, yeah. and we had to revisit every aspect of it. So I loved the bend and flex and the creative challenges that um, documentaries present. And I always wanted to work in documentary. That was always my... Um, where, where, what I was gunning for. Um, oh, okay. And so, yeah, no, very much so, very much so. And I, um, and I, you know, I, I, I like working with interviews and, and then illustrating those. I love, I love working with sound and I kind of like the fact that there's just so much to work, so many elements to work with and get your teeth into with documentary. And I just think it's just a huge editorial challenge. And I also love the fact that, you know, with documentary, you sort of, the, the edit is kind of, in many respects, you know, it, it, it certainly runs in parallel with production, but quite often, you know, if you go to a rap party of a, of a, of a film, uh, quite often, everybody in production knows everybody else. They're all, they've all had this amazing experience where they've traveled the world together. And, um, and the post team will sort, of, will sort of sit together and be like, well, I don't really know anybody here, but it's nice. We're having a great time. Let's just stick together. Um, whereas, uh, again, with documentary, there's a, there's, it's lovely because you end up becoming the hub for immense, so many areas of, of the archivist and the production team and everything like that. And so um, it's just nice to be you know, in the thick of it, basically, for the duration. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I love it. And, um, I, yeah, I do hope I can just keep doing this for, forever, really. You know, it's like, um, <laughs> it's, it's my, definitely my first love. So how do you find any free time looking at your like imdb because we mentioned it earlier like ronnie's sounds like ran right into sparks brothers and then you also have two other credited films coming out this year in make it or die trying and i do not know how to pronounce this other one kipchoge kipchoge, kipchoge the last milestone you. yeah so uh, make it or die trying that that's now out so that's cool but it's um so that was it. That was interesting. That was one that has been running for for years, basically. That oh. was uh, one of the one of the documentary projects that had actually sort of um, it, that had flow in between all of the other projects. So I was actually I'd I'd, I'd done bits on that prior to uh, Ronnie. Mm, okay. Um, and then it would sort of pop up again, and I would do a small section of that, just depending on when they were able to shoot things and things like that. So that's been bubbling away for some time. Um, Kipchoge is a it's a lovely um, film. I'm I'm super proud of it. I. I I love it. I can't really say that much about it, but um, mm -hmm. I. Um, but it is a. It's, it's a lovely, lovely film, and it's, and um, I can't wait for people to see it. Um, and so yes, and they they literally did run back to back. So lockdown for me. Um, come, <laughs> Ronnie's went straight into Sparks, um, and um, and then and then Make It or Die Trying, um, and then you know sort of, uh, and then they went straight into Kipchoge, and then. Um, and Kipchoge has now run straight into the project I'm currently working on, which unfortunately I can't say anything about. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but uh, and and then this this is going to see me through for another nine months or so. So it has been. So in terms of um, life, uh, yeah, I'm I'm very lucky. Um, I sort of my my wife is incredible. I've got two boys, and um, you know the the, 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 what, the one of the most amazing aspects of of working from my suite for an extended period of time is the fact that although I'm my own worst boss and I do, <laughs> I still do incredible hours and, you know, you are actually able to take advantage of the hours where you would have been traveling. However, that you can stop for, you know, sort of half an hour to go downstairs, have dinner with everybody, you know, have breakfast with everybody yeah. and, and actually see them. So, you know, these projects and, and this industry, it's all consuming. It is for everybody involved, but, um, you know, there are, I mean, it's the way that the fact that we're actually able to work remotely um, at all um, does actually have a lot of huge drawbacks, but there are some benefits as well. And being able to sort of see the boys more often and my wife more often. Um, yeah, it's great. So I have one last question for you. I ask everybody um, with Sparks Brothers not including, looking back at your career and everything, what is, you know, your favorite moment? What's like a career highlight for you or even a couple if you can't choose one? Um, what What's your career highlight when you kind of look back and think on um, your career in the industry? 
I think it's really difficult to make a transition from one area of the industry to another one. I think it's mm-hmm. kind of like, and I, I, I was asked recently um, if I had any advice for, you know, sort of people starting out in the industry. And I, I said that if it's possible, if there's any way that you can try and orchestrate the situation through experimentation and the sort of, you have greater flexibility at the beginning of your career. I, I think quite often it doesn't feel like you do. Mm-hmm. Um, and you sort of think, oh, well, I've got an opportunity. I've got to grab that and I'll, and I'll run with it. But actually, you know, there is a greater sense of flexibility because by the time, you know, you've been working in the industry for 10, 20 years, um, you know, you're, you're burdened with many, many life commitments and, you know, you know, you've got to, you've got a lot to look after and you've also built up, um, a vast quantity of connections through the industry. People are aware of what you do and what you have been doing for them. So then trying to change the area in which you're working is actually, you know, it's, it's, it's very difficult. So, um, I think, I think the, the the trend, you know, I had, um, I think going freelance and, you know, sort of being given an opportunity to start working on the behind the scenes documentaries was awesome because it was uh, the first time I had actually worked on a lot of projects that where I was being delivered, um, you know, sort of hundreds of hours of rushes. And it was like, right, where are the stories within this and tracking through and finding it? And it was, a, it was a, you know, a, a nice stage in my career but then progressing from that to thinking right you know what's going to be the first gig that's going to be the first sort of uh you know sort of released documentary um where i'm cutting the main one and and i and 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 actually you know getting that gig getting the first gig in that regard i always remember being you know an amazing moment because i just felt like right here's an opportunity i'm gonna i'm probably gonna grab this and not let this go and so so that was a really wonderful moment um so yeah, there's lots of lots of little things along the way. You know, as I say, going freelance in itself, you know, that's always a, a scary prospect, isn't it? Um yeah. but something, you know, sort of a, like a quite a natural progression. So, you know, sort of doing that and you know, and actually working the other the other thing actually, just as a is, you know, sort of working with the assistants I have over the years and sort of seeing them, you know, sort of then start cutting their own stuff and, you know, um, and just really enjoying that for them and, and working with people. I think that's always been, I've always loved that. You know, I, um, the, the dynamic with myself and assistants is just, I thought it's a, a relationship I really, really appreciate. Um, and, uh, I've been very, very lucky. And so, you know, sort of seeing people grow and develop, um, you know, when I was working in facility, I used to train people up, um, and start them out on their career and, you know, following them online. Now people working all over the world, you know, sort of cutting things and stuff like that. It's, it gives me a great deal of pleasure to be honest with you to sort of see that they've done that. And, and so, yeah, that's a really positive thing as well. Yeah, that is a fantastic positive way uh, to wrap things up. That's amazing. <laughs> so, Paul, thank you again so, so, so much uh, for coming on. Like I said earlier, Sparks Brothers, fantastic documentary. If you want to follow Paul um, on Twitter, like I just did, and you and you have, you absolutely should, uh, it is <laughs> at Paul Trey on Twitter, and I will throw that um, in the description as well. So thank you, Paul, so much for being on today. Thank you so much for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed it. It was absolutely a blast. And remember, guys, if you would like to subscribe to the Justin Editor podcast, we are on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, pretty much everywhere you can find a podcast. We are there. Feel free to like, share, subscribe, and I will see each and every one of you in the edit bay. <laughs> <laughs>